1974, there was a callous and cold-hearted murder of an exceptional young woman. It comes with great honor to announce we solved the 43-year-old cold case. Throughout history, certain crimes have etched themselves into our memory, reminding us of the dark side of humanity, and among these cases, the murder of Arliss Perry stands out as a perplexing enigma that haunted investigators for over four decades. It was the year 1974, when the tranquil confines of Stanford Memorial Church became the stage for a gruesome act that would forever alter the fabric of a community. A young woman with her whole life ahead of her, fell victim to a brutal crime within the hallowed walls of the iconic place of worship. Born on February 22, 1955, Arliss K. Perry spent her early years in Bismarck, North Dakota, where she and Bruce Perry were high school sweethearts. In August 1974, at the age of 19, Arliss moved to the Stanford University campus with her husband Bruce, who was a sophomore pre-med student. She took up a position as a receptionist at a local law firm, immersing herself in the new chapter of her life. However, tragedy struck on the night of October 12, 1974. Around 11.30 p.m., Arliss and Bruce found themselves embroiled in a heated argument over the tire pressure of their car. Seeking solace, Arliss expressed her desire to pray alone inside the Stanford Memorial Church, and they decided to separate for a while. Concern began to mount as time passed, and by 3 a.m., Bruce growing increasingly worried about his wife's absence, contacted the Stanford police to report her missing. However, when officers from the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office arrived at the church, they discovered that all the exterior doors were firmly locked. Stephen Crawford, a former Stanford police officer, and current campus security guard, recently made a chilling discovery. He stumbled upon the lifeless body of Arliss in the early hours of October 13. The scene was haunting. Arliss was found in the east transept of the church, near the altar, lying motionless and face up with her hands folded over her chest. However, what made this tragedy even more horrifying was the presence of an ice pick, jutting out from the back of her head, its handle broken and missing. As if that wasn't enough, signs of strangulation were evident. Authorities also revealed that Arliss was partially unclothed below the waist, and a three-foot-long altar candle was shockingly inserted into her vagina, while another one was placed between her breasts. To add to the macabre nature of the crime, her jeans were meticulously arranged in a diamond-shaped pattern across her legs. Crawford informed the police that he had secured the premises shortly after midnight, noting no signs of suspicious activity. However, when he returned at 5.45 a.m. to open the church for the day, he made a startling observation, the west side door was wide open, and appeared to have been forcibly breached from within. As the investigation unfolded, authorities made unsettling findings. A kneeling pillow near Perry's lifeless body yielded evidence of semen, while a partial palm print was detected on one of the candles. Strangely, neither the semen nor the palm print matched Bruce Perry or Stephen Crawford, raising more questions than answers. Initially, Bruce was considered a person of interest, but subsequent inquiries cleared him of suspicion. The events of October 12th and 13th, revealed that at least seven individuals were present in the church, including Perry and Crawford. While four of them were identified, the identity of the seventh person remained a mystery, adding an intriguing twist to the investigation. A witness recalled encountering a young man with sandy-colored hair, standing around 5 foot 10 with a medium build, preparing to enter the church around midnight. David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, hinted at possessing information about the crime in a series of letters. He cryptically referred to an individual named Manson II as the possible perpetrator, suggesting his involvement. However, investigators, after conducting an interview with Berkowitz in prison, determined that he had no significant insights to offer regarding the Perry case. Despite this, investigative reporter Maury Terry shed light on an intriguing aspect. 
He noted that Berkowitz voluntarily provided information about the case without any prompting. In his 1979 account, he wrote, Arliss Perry, hunted, stalked and slain, followed to California, Stanford University. During his investigation, Terry interviewed Perry's friends in Bismarck, and made an intriguing discovery. It appeared that someone on the Stanford campus had registered a telephone listing under Bruce Perry's name. The resulting confusion arose when Perry's best friend and Bruce's mother attempted to contact the Perrys using this fraudulent phone number, leading Arliss herself to call the number and speak with someone residing at that location. In a letter dated September 27, 1974, addressed to her friend, Perry expressed the following. I had to laugh about your call to Bruce Perry. Mrs. Perry made the same mistake. She called them too, but the strange part of it is that his name is not only Bruce Perry but it is Bruce D. Perry, and not only that but it is Bruce Duncan Perry and he attends Stanford University, and he just got married this summer. One thing, his wife's name is not Arliss. Anyway, next time you get the urge to call, the number is. This time I guarantee you'll get the right Bruce Perry. Despite the passage of time, the Perry case remained unresolved, and was periodically revisited by the cold case unit of the Santa Clara County District Attorney's and Sheriff's Office. However, a significant breakthrough occurred in 2018, when a more advanced DNA test definitively connected Crawford to the murder. On June 28, law enforcement officers arrived at Crawford's residence on Camden Avenue in San Jose, California, approximately 20 miles away from Stanford University. Armed with a search warrant, they intended to apprehend Crawford. Tragically, before he could be taken into custody, Crawford locked his door and took his own life with a pistol, leaving unanswered questions, and a bittersweet sense of closure. Stephen Blake Crawford, 72-year-old, was a security guard at Stanford University at the time of the murder. Crawford had been a person of interest since the beginning of the investigation. Our detectives continued to piece together additional information um, to this tragic puzzle, and we were able recently to link Crawford's DNA to the crime scene. Today our detectives were serving a warrant, and when they knocked on the door of Crawford's residence, he killed himself. Our detectives are still at the scene searching the residence for additional uh, evidence connecting Crawford to this murder and to any other unsolved murders. I cannot understate the efforts of our detectives. They've done an exceptional job. Many cold case homicide detectives have worked on this for years. We followed all the leads and unraveled the entanglement of the evidence associated with the murder of Arliss Perry. The tragic story of Arliss Perry stands as a poignant testament to the shadowy depths of human nature and the relentless pursuit of justice, even in the face of long-standing mysteries. May her memory be honored, and may her loved ones find solace in knowing that some semblance of truth has been revealed.